Morning, Facebook. How are we? Monday morning. So I'm going to try and bring Michael in on this. So let me just see if I can press the right buttons. Uh, no, that's not the right button. One minute. Oh, we love a technical drama. <laughs> One minute. Um. Oh, how do I do this then? Morning, Stella. How are you? Morning, Demir. I am trying to bring the other person in and it's not working properly. Let's, what's happening here? What is going on? Oh, let's have a little look here. Oh, I did this fine the other day. Now it's not working. <laughs> How are we all anyway this sunny Monday morning? Are we good? Are we good? No, look, see, it's not working. Why is this? Mike, if you're watching, I'm... Uh... Right, let me see if I can bring... Here we go. Here we go. Uh, A-E-L. Right, invite. And then... <laughs> oh, morning, Caroline. How are you? <clears throat> morning, Holly. All of you're doing is just watching me stare at a screen at the minute. <laughs> Uh, technical dramas. Ah! Oh no, what is happening? Morning from Spain. We love that. We love that. Why can't I? Why can't I do it this morning? Oh dear. I did a test run and everything. How annoying for you all who've made the effort to come on here. Um. <clears throat> Right, okay, I'm gonna go and come. Oh, oh, here we go. Michael is now here, ad for watching. We've got it, guys, I think we've got it. Michael, are you in? Add in, it says add in. Thank you for understanding, Stella, I appreciate that. It's also very early on a Monday and I'm gonna be brutally honest, I've not had a coffee yet, so this could go either way right now. <laughs> Yay! There hey! Morning, how you Michael. doing? Good morning, how are you? I'm all right, how are you? Oh, good, good. I'm getting some strange looks in London, but hey, oh, I'm just going to get a nice little spot to sit. Londoners are weird anyway, so don't worry about that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm fitting in, I'm actually part of it. Absolutely. Let me grab a seat. How are you? Yeah, very well, thank you. I've had an awesome good weekend. Stuff. Um, and yeah, really excited about this week. Got loads going on. So very, very, very excited. Thank you very much for coming on so early. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Not a problem at all. So for um, everyone's benefit, uh, everyone who's tuning in now, you know, we've got a few people coming on. Good morning to you all. Thank you very much for coming on. Um, and obviously for anybody who watches this after this morning, um, I just wanted to really briefly introduce you, Mike, in terms of um, how we've worked together. And then actually, I, want to, I was going to hand over to you to just kind of introduce your um, who you are and what you do and stuff like that. But um, okay, I've okay. worked with you since, what, February 2017? Must have been. Yes. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. February yeah. 2017, if I remember correctly. Two seconds, I'm just getting my charger. Um, no worries. <laughs> Mike was one of my business coaches at that point. Oh, my charger's just fallen out the wall. Oh, we love a technical glitch in the morning. Who says you need to pre plan, eh? Oh, it's pre planned, but. Yeah. <laughs> technology just doesn't like me today, apparently. Oh. It's fine, we've got it under control. We've got it under control. Here we go, here we go. Right, so yeah, um, Mike, I've worked with Mike since February 2017. Um, and when I first met Mike, our first ever meeting, Mike asked me to explain my company to him and explain what I did to him. and asked me to describe the structure and who was involved and all these different things and um probably a fair way to explain mike's response was what the fuck if i remember correctly um <laughs> yeah i didn't realize we were going to go go there quite so early but yeah actually what oh, the yeah, fuck let's do it. Go hard <laughs> the home, right? so, uh. the reason for that guys was because when i set my company up I'd never really run a business properly before. I really didn't know 
what I should be doing, what I shouldn't be doing. I didn't know who I should be involving, who I shouldn't be. And I was doing absolutely everything, scrapping around all the time, doing things myself. And I had all different departments. All, I was trying to do everything. And not only was I trying to do everything inside my business, my business was trying to do about eight different things as well, all at the same time. And my mind was exploding, but I thought that was how it had to be when you're in business. I thought you had to be really busy. And if I was busy, I was going to be successful. Um, yeah. And actually, I sit, I sat and had this meeting with Mike. And he rolled his eyes at me a little bit and just went, yeah, we can help you fix all of this. So, um, Mike, just introduce yourself a little bit and how, what you do and who you do it for. And, you know, what, a bit about how we worked together over the last year. Um, and then I've got a lot okay. of questions for you. Lovely stuff. Okay, so good morning, everyone. My name is Mike. Um, so uh, I've got a bit of a d dotted history, but let me let me d dive back probably five, six years. Um, so I've run various businesses, um, some failed, some more successful than others, and sold one on. Um, and within these businesses, I'm you know as as in most cases, I'm working with whether I'm selling, whether I'm working with my employees, whether I'm working with clients, whatever that is, and. It's, it goes without saying, really, that the success, the successes or the ability to overcome that comes with the ability to deal with people in different formats. Um, so, again, going back further than that, 10, 15 years ago, I started learning about NLP, so neuro-linguistic programming. So, really understanding how people work, how the mind works. Um, getting into the right frame of mind, you know, we hear that so often is that I'm not in the right frame of mind for this or I'm not in the right state for this. Um, and that for me, bringing NLP into the business world rather than have it as an isolated hobby, which I did 15 years ago, uh, really integrating that in a, in a sensible way into my business. And again, it goes into your life and into so many things. That really is what allows me to feel that I've got the edge, not not it allows me to, to be this great person, but it, it certainly allows me to be flexible in different scenarios. So whether it is in a sales format, whether it's working with you know, employees or whatever it might be, the ability to change the state, to change kind of who I need to be in that given moment um, is, is, yeah, is, is the bit that I kind of take with me and I, I help other, other businesses uh, and, other, and certainly yourself and other people that I work with in NLP training, it's allowing people that, to go from, you know, Mike, the, you know, this weekend is, I've been Mike the dad, and then I, I jump on the train this morning, I need to be Mike someone else, and on Facebook Live now, I need to be Mike for someone else. So what is it that allows you to create these state changes to be the best version of you um, in any given moment? So, you know, that's as much as I do the NLP training and, and I run a business as well, the real key piece for me is helping people quite quickly uh, change their state to be who they need to be in any, any given moment. Um, so good morning, Demir. I've seen your name pop up. So that's quite nice. It's the first time I've said good morning on a Facebook live. Uh, yeah. So, so, so what else, what else do you want to know from me? You've got Kelly. Oh, hello. Yeah, I've got a few. Yes. Oh, Jade. How does NLP change the state that you are in? NLP doesn't change the state. So do you mind if I just give a, a few yeah, minutes yeah, to, a bit of an introduction? Okay. So firstly, um, with NLP, you might hear people saying, you know, learn NLP, you can be more persuasive, more manipulative, and NLP is a thing. NLP isn't a thing. So NLP was kind of created in the 70s by two uh, obsessive compulsive guys who were researching um, psychotherapists at the time and what makes them really effective. So all they did is they sat back and they, and, they, and they studied these psychotherapists and say, what is it that that person's doing that's making them effective? And then they distilled those pieces. So NLP wasn't created to be manipulative or, or, or for sales or for therapy. It was, it was formed from uh, two nutty professors effectively studying what works. So what came from that is then models of um, they call it models of excellence, but you know, let's keep it simple models of what works. Um, and then, and then that can be then be applied. So NLP doesn't change your state, but because of NLP, because of the nutty professors, they studied people who were able to change their state. They were like, okay, so what are they doing there? How does someone go from, um, you know, Jenny, the mum to, to Jenny, the barrister in, in 12 minutes how does she step and change those states and again they deduce the models from that it might be something they're wearing something they say to themselves a way that they stand the way they present themselves 
there's, there's a number of ways to do that. But, you know, NLP, let's get make it clear, it doesn't do any, anything. And NLP isn't a thing. NLP is the study of what works. So um, I just want to kind of cover that off. It's not about learning this kind of mystical thing and, the, and certain language patterns. NLP is about what's working. So that's where it, that's where it originates from. Yeah, and I think from like my experience of NLP, which is albeit very minimal, because I, yeah, I've done a, I've done the uh, NLP practitioner course, I've done a five day course. Um, Mike's an NLP trainer as well, so um, and, a, and a coach. And one of the things I took away from NLP was actually not so much. And I remember talking to my friends about this after. It wasn't so much about what I thought I was going to get from NLP is some like tips and tricks on how to um, persuade better. And actually what NLP gave me was the ability to think about my, uh, how I felt about things differently, which allowed me to then use myself in a, as a tool in a different way. So it was about, the, you know, the way I asked questions as a coach, when I'm training and I'm mentoring people, the series of questions that I ask to get to understand what it is that they are trying to do, actually by just thinking differently about the way that I think about things, that's what it gave me. It gave me a different sort of set of, of um, like a process to take my own thoughts through. And I thought that was quite interesting because that's not what I was yeah. expecting of NLP. Yeah, um, yeah. Like well, when I do NLP training courses, I, I, you know, I sit down with a room full of people and I say that you come here on this six or eight day or 14 day training and you're here to learn, you're here to gain some new insights and new knowledge. But I've got to, I need to cover this off in the first 10 minutes. You're going to walk away with more questions uh, and less answers <laughs> than you true. came with. Let's just make that clear. And again, you are right. It's not about strategy. It's not about learning certain techniques. The, the bit that I say kind of it's if you can get this one piece of NLP, then, then you'll be able to create NLP. And that's curiosity. You've got to wonder. You know, it's not about having the answer. So when you pick up a phone, a, a phone to calling a, a client or an agent or whatever it might be, you might have a script. You know, so you have your process that, you, that you're choosing to follow at that time. Now, if that doesn't work, then it's a case of, okay, so what is it that I'm doing that's making that not work? Yeah. Uh, what can I change? So, so it all sits on curiosity. And, you know, if you come back to the nutty professors who, who looked at that from an NLP perspective, the reason they were able to effectively form NLP was because they were ultimately curious about what was working. And again, you, take, you just take that one piece into sales, into business, into <laughs> management, uh, negotiation, whatever it is, it's about, okay, what am I doing? Uh, what do I need to do? What am I not doing? from a position of curiosity rather than just kind of dogged determination, then yeah. you know, that's the one thing I think is key for it. I think you're absolutely right. And I think at the point in my sales career where I started to really care mm. why my customer needed me more than I cared yeah. about what I was getting paid, at that yeah. moment, that's when I started to make more money. You know, yeah. and that's, that goes back a long time ago, sort of in my recruitment world. The second I started to actually just care about what they mm. needed rather than what yeah. I wanted them to need and having that curiosity yeah. about how I could actually help them that's yes. the point and I you know I remember when that started to happen in my sales career because things just started to change and naturally things just yeah. fell into place and I think in property yeah. as well to bring it into context for this group and this audience who are mm. all property entrepreneurs in some way shape or form you know we've got guys yeah. on here who are sourcing property for other investors we've got guys on here who are building their own portfolios we've got people who are building development businesses rent to rent businesses sourcing businesses all sorts to bring it into context when you're building your property business one of the things that we say all the time is actually you get paid as a consequence of doing a good job for somebody else and for yeah. you to be able to do that job in the best way possible getting curious about what they need by asking yeah. a series of questions and asking good questions, questions that yeah. actually will give you content to work with, that is a really yeah. important tool for you to be able to yeah. do. So Mike, tell, I've had a couple of questions come through, but guys, if you have got any questions about how you can use your, you know, shift your state, how you can build your mindset, any of these sorts of things to help you in business, you know, it's Monday morning, 8 a.m., we might all need a bit of a kick <laughs> It's a good time for it. Yeah, absolutely. If you've got any questions or anything for Mike or me, put them in the comments box and we'll cover them. Um, but one of the questions I did get asked, Mike, on the lead up to this um, Facebook Live was, yeah. what do you think is, well, it was more about kind of what's the hardest, what's the reason people find it hard 
to change state and actually forget about them for a minute and actually become curious what's the reason that we find that so difficult and what's the if there is one what's the the kind of recommendations you give or uh, suggestions or tips to fix that yeah well interestingly now the 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 reason we are in our own head is because typically i i Okay, there's a bit about sales. I want to come back to that, but let's let's you know we're going into interaction or need to or would like to um, like to become more curious. But in order to whenever we arrange a phone call or a meeting, whoever it is, we have our own set of intentions. Like you like you mentioned earlier, we know what we have to sell or what we could do or what products or services we can pass on. So we yeah. go into the interaction with that, and it's almost you know it, I don't depends on where people are in their in their sales career or property sourcing career or wherever they are within this but in order to kind of feel um congruent so that you don't feel like an imposter you feel you know this is what i do i am a property sourcer and i do this as a role there's a piece there about making sure that you uh that you confidently believe that. So within the, within, within the kind of start of the process, you might be talking to yourself or thinking about, okay, what do I need to say? I must cover this off. I must. See, we get so wrapped it up in our head. And it, again, it's covered off just by being curious. And there's a piece there that, um, you know, the preparation of, you know, we hear this kind of preparation is key, but actually that you can't prepare unless you, um, or the preparation is wasted if you're not ultimately curious. So for me, it's about kind of preparing a, a day or two before about whatever that whatever you might need to do and then go in and kind of accept that you've done all you can. Uh, I've got all for, I can't prepare for this anymore because I don't really know what this client is after. Um, so, yeah, I haven't really covered that off. Let me think about that again. So I think what, one of the things that I've kind of taken from that and it's just made me think about investors. So there's a mm. lot of um, people in this group who will be building their investor list to sell deals on to similarly to how what I do in my business. I know there's some okay. people on the call who are people I've trained one to one and I work with and things like that. And one of the cardinal sins about working with investors is that you start with your agenda. And actually yeah. what you've just said yeah. there really reinforces that. And you know, when you have an investor, yeah. What, what the, the, the mistake that people make is that they speak to their investor and say, right, this is the deal that I've got. How yeah. do we kind of stick this square peg into your yeah, round yeah, hole, right? Yeah. That doesn't yeah. work. And actually, no. there's a lot of people that will get deals and they won't be able to sell them because they've not bothered or taken the time or the effort. Curiosity, I love that word, to, oh, I think we've lost Mike. Let me get you back, Mike lost the um they've not taken the time or the energy or the effort ask the investor what they want first does that make sense i think we lost you for a minute mike but you're back you so. did and and actually that came on to when i first started my ramble i said sales and i said i'm going to come on to that in a minute and then i went off on a waffle and you just <laughs> you just hooked me back in because um yeah, that's what i'm here for sorry that's what i'm here for <laughs> i am the hook Okay, are we all back in? Yes, we joined the video. Okay, we're all back on. Yeah, so the, the thing is with sales, you look at the, the kind of connotations or the semantics around the word sales, you know, and we link that to people saying things like, you know, I can sell an ice to an es Eskimo. And there's something that's presupposed that we think that we need to drive what we have into the client and it's completely not yeah. the case. Um, so it's, you know, perhaps change or see the word as sales is as servicing you know, it's, it's a process yeah. that you're doing. You're not selling because, you know, you're not going to sell someone a property sourcing deal. Is if they haven't got the money, they don't like you, they don't trust you, it's not for them. So you, you can't do that. So I, so I think for me, the kind of connotations that around the word sales is just ditch them. Um, no one likes a salesperson unless unless they're selling you a car that you want and you've got the money for and, and they're offering you all the extras you're going to get anyway. I love my Audi salesperson. <laughs> um, but, you know, for me, and again, you know, there's this something about being the salesperson. You know, we see it as, you know, they need to be, you know, sharp and dress a certain way and act a certain way and they they may be boshy or bolshy and all those things. And they're exactly, exactly the traits you do not want. Um, yeah. so, you know, for, for me, whenever someone's stepping into this interaction, like you mentioned, how do they get that, that state is first really understanding what it means to be a, a, uh, a quality, um, to, to service that person in the best possible way and what that means. And it yeah. definitely doesn't mean being a, a cocky, bullshit square peg and round hole salesperson. So, you know, take, take that piece. 
I think as well, when you're, um, if I remember back to when I started my property business and I remember thinking, you know, this is what other people are doing. This is how they're doing it. And so I'm going to kind of try and replicate that. And I very, very, very quickly realized that the system and the process that they follow, mm. that's what I need to replicate. Yeah. But you need to be the authentic version of you. Absolutely. Otherwise, actually, it's really difficult. Yeah. Like if I try to kind of sell or service in the same way that it, like other people in my team do, mm. I would never make any no, money because no. I'd really struggle. Yeah. me sorry i think i think it cut out for you did for a second then i've got I've just, yep fine i've hung up on him hopefully he won't call me back but if he does i should have told him not to call me yes. this morning but never mind um we love live we love it when it's live um i remember yeah i learned really quickly that actually if you're not the authentic version of you then it's really really hard to do and so now you know when i go out to meetings some people say this is wrong some are you know everyone has their own opinion but I go to meetings in my jeans and my trainers because that's the authentic version of me. You know, I've met with investors in my hoodie and my jeans and my trainers and raised £240,000 for a deal because that's me. Yeah. And actually, people buy from me. If you put me in a suit and you ask me to have a meeting with an investor, yeah. I would completely fumble it. I wouldn't because I'm not comfortable in myself. No. And so actually, I'd present this weird mm. corporate version of me. Yeah. And that just wouldn't ever, I'd never close anything. And I think yeah. that comes back to, one, my mindset yeah. and being confident that I'm just going to be me. Yeah. Some people hate it. You know, there's, I've, there's lots of people that don't want to work with me because I swear, because I wear trainers and that's fine. Yeah. I'm comfortable with that. But also it's important that you can scale the version of you that you're delivering. And actually, yeah. if you're trying to be something that you're not, and I was always like this in recruitment, yeah. it was never quite me because I was caught, I was in a suit every day. Yeah. It never really scaled properly. I never really enjoyed it enough. Yeah. And so actually, the, having the confidence in my own mindset, yeah. because I'm curious, because I genuinely want to serve and yeah. help my customers, that is what allows me to actually build a bigger business and scale because they get me, yeah. they get the, the, you know, the version of me. And I think that's a really important thing for people to take away yeah. is that um, the mindset part of it mm. and bringing yourself into that sales environment, into that marketing environment, mm. so that you actually are building a brand that's new. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. You you to want to dive back to one of the first questions regarding um, how do, how about state changing? You know, how do you manage yeah. your state? You've just hit the nail on the head there. We all totally understand that if we wear a suit in or out of context where we feel or don't feel comfortable, that can transform how we feel and how we act and how yeah. we react. So, and again, it's about that congruency. So it's not about, okay, so a salesperson looks like they're sharp and they wear this suit. And they, if you put that on and it doesn't fit, you will be clunky. You will be, it won't work. So, you know, if yeah. you've got to show up as your best self and that's a prime example of how, um, state changes uh, or how we can affect our own state both positively and negatively by not being yeah. congruent not being true to ourselves that's a great point yeah and I think you know like Kelly, Kelly's just made a point on the comments just saying you know um, that being authentic after coming from a corporate background can be quite tough because you've got all these preconceived ideas of what business should look like and what you should be doing. Now, I hate the word should. It's a word that I really try not to use because I think when you use the word should, you should be doing this, you should be doing that, yeah. you sh they should be doing this. Actually, it's they should be doing it by my standards. Yeah. And actually, that's irrelevant yeah. because I did another video on this at the weekend. What other people are doing is none of your business. What other people are doing is irrelevant. Yeah. All you've got to do is do the best you can, turn up and deliver what you need to deliver day in, day out. Absolutely. You shouldn't. It's not a should thing. Yeah. Do things because you want to do them. Yeah. But yeah, the corporate world does give you some preconceived ideas. And I know there's a lot of people that I, certainly I train, yeah. um, that are coming out of the corporate space and trying to work out what the authentic version yeah. of them is yeah. because it's been beaten out of them of for so long. Yeah. Um, if you want to find out what the authentic version of someone is, if you can get them out for um, a wine and a half or a beer and a half and you're standing relaxed, that generally gives the, the most authentic. Yeah. Well, that gives you the authentic version and that's good enough for business. When you've had six or seven, then that gives you the one you probably don't want to do business with. But, you know, the, it, it's amazing how, you know, that that version that you need to be is exactly when the corporates break for lunch on a Friday and go and have two or three beers on the pub or whatever. It's just the environment changes. And when you 
it's not yeah. it's not the beer it's the environment and you can loosen up that's when the authentic person can come out and you know um that's who you need to be so who who are you when you when you're in that interaction after the first kind of mouthful and you and you're, you're chatting to so, your colleagues so here's an action point for you all i want you to write this down go to the pub <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, it's not even quarter past eight on a Monday, and we're suggesting have a drink. Listen, it's five pm somewhere. I'm sure. Right? It's not so Friday. Right, let's say, um, if if there's some anybody listening to this video, anybody watching the video uh, or watching it at any point in the future, that is struggling with building their or being prepared and feeling confident to make a cold call or to pick up the phone, not just to property people, but anybody, what would you say are the top sort of tips to, pre to actually prepare themselves for that call and get themselves into state before they pick that phone up so that they can feel in the best place possible? What would you say is the, the, the steps or the tips that you, they can go through okay. to actually be ready for picking that phone up? So first things first is you, you, and it has to start here. This, the problem with words like preparation it's, it's almost like you're I'm preparing for a sale. In other words, that's like preparing for battle. That's like getting ready for, <laughs> getting ready for a fight. And that's not what it's about. So when, when you, so the very first piece is when you're picking up the call, it's to understand, picking up the phone or going for a meeting, is you're not there to sell anything to anyone. You're there to service them, to help them, to give them opportunities. So you, you need to be... Um, you need to understand that what you're doing is helping them. You're, they're not helping you if they buy off you. So that you're, not, yeah. you're not selling to them. You've not got to push something down there. You're saying, look, I've got this great opportunity. Um, I suppose the, the state for me is almost like, um, uh, I, I don't know where I've got this. I've seen lots of people walk around, but you know, imagine in a wallet it's just being dropped and you're picking it up and you go to someone and say, excuse me, I don't know if this is yours, but if it is, would you like it back? Type state so it's a state of curiosity it's wonderment and can i help so that very first yeah. piece needs to start in uh but cold calling seems like that's not true valeria we'll come on to that in a second yeah. let mike just finish off this point but i'd I'd definitely like to comment on that yeah yeah so the, the first piece is whenever you're cold calling or meeting is just understand that you're not selling you're you know you are you are you have an opportunity or opportunities that you can create relationships that you're looking to build um but you're coming from a position of being uh of being the authority the authority in the field to help them do something that they can't do without you now, until you believe that, you're going to feel like you're constantly going into battle and constantly needing to prepare and constantly being... The thing is, with any battle, even if you win, you get a punch and it hurts. So it's not about battling. It's about discussing and opportunities and timing. And if someone says no for the first time, it just means not now. If someone says no and your call isn't going well, you've got to try and reframe that situation. It's not about you. You know, it's about them. You've called them while they have, have had the morning from hell. Um, the reason they've been horrible to you on, on the phone is because somewhat they've just had a, a disaster of a deal that's just fall, fallen over just before your call. So get out yeah. of your head. It's not about you. Um, and the thing that I say to everyone, I'm coming on an NLP training course or in coaching is guess what, guys? You're just not good enough. And what I mean by that is, <laughs> you know, you're not, you're not Donald Trump. You're not Barack Obama. All eyes aren't on you. You're just not that important. None of us are. So don't take, take things to heart. You know, if someone says things to you that, that might seem like they're, they're hitting your character or you're not good enough, you know what, you, you don't worry about it because you, you're just not that important enough to, for people to consider you. So just be, yeah. be all you can is what I'd say. Uh, and the whole preparation thing, there are things to cover with state management and state control and lots of things. But what sits underneath all of that is your understanding that you're there to service and not sell. Um, yeah, that's paramount. So um, one of my very good friends shared a quote with me last week, uh, which is one of Jordan Belfort's quote, which is the only objection is uncertainty. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. The only objection ever is uncertainty. So just to reinforce what Mike said, if people aren't engaging with you yet, it's because you've not done a good enough job yet of explaining how you help them. Yeah. You are not good enough yet. You haven't got to that point yet. And that's, it, it feels a bit harsh to say it like that, but actually, you know, it took me probably a year to get good enough 
of consistent, relentless calls all the time, all the time, all the time. Calls, 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 calls. You know, Mike worked with me in my office for a year, saw how much I was, I worked and how long hours I work and things like that in my first year. And those calls, as soon as I started to just reframe the kind of questions I was asking, yeah. everything changed. Yeah. When I first started, I wanted them to, I wanted them to have my service. Now, actually, I believe in my service. I know that it works for people, and I can take it or leave it. Mm. I'm more than happy to walk away from somebody if, if I've not done a good enough job, if they don't really understand it or they don't need it. But it's the uncertainty that you have to be able to overcome. Absolutely. It's that uncertainty. The only way you overcome uncertainty is by asking them more questions so that you can then show them yeah. and give them certainty by answering the questions that they've actually got. Yeah. I don't know if anyone's seen the, um, the, the iceberg diagram, the objection handling iceberg. And it says, you know, um, that most, like 90% of an iceberg is underwater or something like that. I'm basically guessing at this. I've seen a picture of it and I've got it in my head, but I can't remember the percentages. So 90% of your objection is actually uncertainty that's yeah. below the surface that they will never say out loud. People don't buy on price. They never buy on price. They buy on the level of service you can give them and then they justify with price. They buy on how you make them feel and then they justify with price. So, you know, the reason we know this is because people spend £100,000 on a car when they can spend £3,000 on a car. Because people will spend twenty thousand pounds on a watch when they could buy a Casio for ten quid. Yeah. You know, it's people don't buy on price. Yeah. People justify with price. So whenever you're entering into a sales environment, if you're going to someone's house to present a pitch or an order, if you're going to an agent to present a pitch for rent to rent, for example, come back to what Mike's been saying, which is find out how actually yeah. you can make them feel better. They will then pay you for that service. That's just generally how it works. Mm. Absolutely. So, Mike, in terms of um, confidence, yeah, so mindset in the sales and negotiations environment definitely links to confidence. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. How, for those of people that are on here that are not confident yet in what they're doing, and they, because they're still learning yes. the skills, they're still learning the strategies, they're still learning the, you know, all the, the back office stuff that we do yeah what's what's some ways that people could um kind of retrain and reframe their own internal thinking to feel more confident day to day okay so it, and again it depends on it comes down to in what scenario or what example so let's say let's say it's for uh cold calling because that's a that's the obvious yeah. one um what i'd suggest is uh the first, the first thing is reframe what it really means. You're just calling someone just like you call someone when, when you pick up the phone to discuss your, your bill is too high with BT. It's just a cold call, yeah. effectively. You don't know who you're going to speak to, but you're calling in that frame of mind. There's that piece again that when you're trying to sell, we think we need to be someone that we're not. So it's about being the authentic you. So the, what, what I do to, to start to train this is that, you know, there's a pieces of, um, in NLP terms, kind of anchoring or set or kind of making states more readily available. Now, the person you need to be to make call, cold calls is 95% of the same person you need to be whenever you're making a complaint call to BT. You're curious, you're wondering what it's about, you're asking about the bill and you're seeing what you can do. It's nearly the same structure as you're picking up the phone, you're saying, is this opportunity right for you? What opportunity would be right for you? How can I best serve you? So, so much of a call is the same. So, there's a piece there about reframing, but from a from a, a, a state from a fundamental state change point of view, what I do is to recognise that there are similarities. Anchoring, absolutely, Stella, um, and I would begin to anchor those states in very similar. Uh, s similar circumstances, but yeah, anchoring can be done in a few ways. So let's just quickly understand what anchoring is. It's a uh, Pavlov dog, if you've heard of that, when the, the guy rang a bell every time he fed his dogs, and then the very sound of ringing a bell then would make the dog salivate because they knew what was coming next. So what you can do for a, for a state change uh, is... Um, Again, we mentioned Jordan Belfort here already, but you know he, he uses something called olfactory anchorings. That means that the sense of smell and linking that to a certain state. So uh, if, if you're making calls to BT to complain about your bill or making cold, uh, cold calls out or calls out to other people where you are feeling confident, is then start to uh, have a, a, 
it could be he uses a um, like a stick called Boom Boom Stick, which is a quite a strong smelling uh, inhaler, like an aromatherapy inhaler. So whenever he's having those feelings of, yeah, I have confidence and I, I feel good about this, he'd sniff this inhaler and it's just a scent. And then that allows you then in the in slightly different scenario where you are making a cold call, when you think, okay, I've got this, you take that smell and therefore you'll, you'll create more of those feelings associated with the pastime that you had. Now, you can anchor by having imagined events and really seeing yourself kind of stepping in, making those calls and really link that to a word or whatever it might be in your mind. But to make it really real is to understand that so much of what you need to be in certain circumstances, you're doing it anyway. So anchor those states and then you'll have more, have more of that resource um, when, available when you need it. Amazing, that amazing, amazing. So anchoring is really clever. It makes perfect sense to me. Um, Anchoring is a really clever thing, and I know I know there's other people like um, I hang out with a lot of people that do talks and speakers now, and you know some of the best speakers I know have got anchors where they like hit their chest to yeah. kind of bring their physiology up to build to open their chest up so their body gets more oxygen, it builds their confidence, they can get into state to go on to stage, mm. um, you know, and there's all different anchors that you can use, and I think you know I'm I'm not actually sure what anchors I use i should probably really try and concentrate and find out mm. what they are but mm. i definitely know that the states that i get into for different environments so it'd be interesting to know what my what my anchors are i'd like to do that absolutely so, yeah um, absolutely. I, how long have we been on here i've got no indication of time because there's no clock about i think all. about 40 35 35 minutes i think right so i only really wanted to do half an hour <laughs> and i'm now late for a meeting but i'm enjoying it so it doesn't matter <laughs> So, no, it's fine. Like no, I'm so, fine. Honestly, we can stay on. It's fine if you need to. Okay, cool. Um, is there any specific questions that every, anybody that's listening has got that wants us to kind of cover off or any comments they want to kind of share or anything like that? Um, Valeria, I know your comment, if I just could touch on that, which was um, cold calling's not seen like this at the other end. I actually totally disagree with that. And the reason for that is that when I make cold calls because I approach it in the way that we've been talking about and I don't approach it like the PPI man and just start pounding words down the phone into someone's ear, actually people engage with me. I ask really, I, I ask questions at the beginning to find, to check, to kind of qualify and check, you know, when I'm ringing up, let's say, I don't know, a landlord that's advertising their house for, for rent. Hi, uh, you, um, am I ringing about the right house? Is it the right person I'm speaking to? Um, I'm looking to rent your house. Actually, immediately we come out of cold and into qualified and into relevant. Yeah. And then I ask them some questions. So what is it that, what, what are you looking for a tenant that's long term, it's short term? You know, what is it that you need? This is what we do. Do you think it would work for you? These are the sorts of services we offer. How would that help you? You know, actually, this, the second they answer the phone, it's not really cold anymore. Mm. Um, you know, yes, I do have people that. You know, I still have people that hang up on me. You know, that's the nature of what we do. And you have to get comfortable with being told no. Mm. Um, read a book called Go For No, if you've not read that already. It's a book that I, I tell everyone that they should read. But you have to get comfortable with being told no. You know, I've got a friend who uh, sources and packages deals in Bristol. And she has done over 200 deals. She reckons she's made about twenty to 30,000 phone calls to do those 200 deals. Now, she's, she's a multimillionaire now, but she had to make, she had to put the graft in. You know, just by having a good mindset and good confidence and so on and so forth doesn't mean that 100% of your calls are going to hit. You have to be prepared to be told no and get comfortable with that. That's the nature of the industry that we're in. But yeah. Valeria, if you just approach your calls in a way that is curious and is about them and not you, I think you'll find that the way they react to you is, a diff is, is definitely different. Yeah. Um, but Caroline has asked, Mike, do you have a tip for a quick way to flip the mood if you're spiraling off on a down day? I absolutely do. Let's hear it. What you need to do is move. You know, if you're feeling a certain way, you've got to move. You've got to generate some more energy. So, so step away from the computer, step away from the phone and do something different. So what we tend to do is we'll, we get frustrated. We recognize our mood isn't right. It's not right for the phone call or not right for where you need to be. And then you'll go, oh, well, I wish I had something different. We'll do something different. So to come back to anchors again. And Sarah said, what are my anchors for uh, motivation or positivity or creativity or whatever they might be? Something that's fundamental 
fundamental in everyone is moving, is breathing, is changing your state. Here you go. Michael says, stay active, move. And it, you can shake a state off. What most of us will tend to do if you work from your home office is you'll walk downstairs, you wish you had something better, you'll wonder why you've got that, you'll start asking yourself, can I do that? So, okay, so play to these um responses that we all have and think okay so what you might have a might have an anchor for a certain song that you put on uh, mine might be eye of the tiger but i wouldn't admit to that um <laughs> <laughs> but whatever it is whatever it is get up shake it off you know you have to in order to create a new emotion you know tony robbins says create motion move around go and do something sing shout do something but certainly don't sit there wishing for something to be different so if you change your physical state you will change your emotional state and that's the quickest way to do it so I remember back in uh, my recruitment days when I used to, and back in when I did like territory management, I used to drive around loads and I'd have to go to meetings and things like that. And <coughs> I would pull up, whenever I was going to a sales meeting and I, I really needed to negotiate, and <coughs> I, was gonna be, I needed to leave with an order in yeah. that meeting, I would either put really heavy hard house on yeah. or really fast hardcore on and I'd get myself all pumped up and ready and ready and ready to go and then I'd go in there and I would sell. Yeah. And I think that really helped me. Whereas if I'd have listened to like, I don't know, the radio, I probably wouldn't have been in the same state. Yeah. And I think what you said about movement is, is actually, it, it is, works in my world. Like if I'm having one of them days, I just shut my laptop and I leave the office and go somewhere else. Mm. And I, it clears, it clears the fog. And then I come back and I can get on with whatever or I go home or whatever. So yeah, I mean, really, really good tip. And another very quick, so, let's, um, I just want to quickly cover one thing off. Let's say, you mentioned a kind of down mood and whatever, whatever your workspace is in front of a computer with your phone, whatever it might be. And we mentioned anchoring and state. You need to make sure that space that you're working is a positive anchor that you're sitting down. And when you do, you are, let's do this. And I've got this. And I'm looking forward to a hundred no's today. All that stuff needs to be linked to that space that you're in. So, if you are finding your mood is down or low, get out of that space. You know, that's ultimately important. And when you are feeling good, come back to that space. So you'll make sure that whenever you sit in your office or wherever you work from, that you've anchored that state to a positive, uh, conducive uh, feeling that you need. Amazing. Really good tip. Really good tip. I think I um, definitely notice a difference when my office is like in chaos with like wires and boxes for events and all these sorts of things. And when it's like, I've got like clean desks, the girls laugh at me because I really like to have like nothing on the desk at all. <laughs> like the fact that there's a box on top of my filing cabinet drives me mental. Yeah. But that's because if there's, if there's stuff everywhere, I feel a bit chaotic. Yeah. So I think that it definitely just it changes my state. Absolutely. And I think it's a really interesting point. So I'm going to, um, I'm going to wrap it up. Guys, I am um, I'm running an event with Mike as one of my guest trainers on the 7th and 8th of July. Um, there's three spaces left on it. It's in Milton Keynes. Um, it's going to be an awesome event. There's actually myself, Mike, and another guest trainer who I will introduce to you at some point, but not yet. I'm not sure you're ready for it yet. Um, and uh, So if anyone wants to know any details about that, but it's very specifically about sourcing property. So we are going to be talking about all the things we've covered this morning, uh, but we're also going to have a, we're going to put you on the phones. Mike and myself are going to coach you through those calls. So that actually, you know, Valeria, if you are feeling like your cold calls are not hitting the point where they need to be to start building your pipeline and building your business, we're going to help you using our scripts with your scripts, with our methods of state change and our methods of language the questions we ask, the way that we do things in our businesses to drive at your business forward. So if anyone wants details about that event, 7th and 8th of July, it's two full days in Milton Keynes, then just PM me after this and I will uh, get the details out to you and we can get your slot. But there is only three spaces because the venue is pretty much full. Uh, in fact, Kelly's just posted the link, so the link's in the comments. If anyone is interested in having a look. Um, Mike, thank you so much for taking us this you. morning. It's been really helpful for me, and I'm sure it's been helpful for the group as well. So amazing, amazing, amazing work. Um, I will speak to you soon, and I will see you in July. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you all. No worries. See you later. Bye, bye, bye. Bye. Thanks, everybody. So, guys, I'm going to wrap up now. Thank you so much for uh, staying tuned and joining me this morning.
that was really, really helpful for you and is a good uh, way for you to kick your Monday morning off. Actually, it's totally woken me up. I've still not had a coffee, but my speech has gone at normal Sarah point and pace. So I'm clearly awake, which is good. Um, I'm going to crack on. If anyone wants the details about that event, obviously, I'll make sure I get that to you. Valeria, I'll PM you now so you've got the information. We can maybe have a chat about how we can get you booked on. Um, have an amazing, amazing day and I will catch you soon. See ya, bye.